in, incidentally, in my discussion sections, people got too excited about charisma, so we um, did speak a lot about charisma. Um, I ask your patience, uh, we will cover some of the same grounds, but I hope I can give you new jokes about charisma. Uh, this is one of the most uh, exciting features of Weber theory, and probably one of, next to the Protestant ethic, right? The one which em entered the common language more than anything else, right? That we all talk about charisma and the people's charisma or charismatic leaders all the time, just like the Protestant word ethic, we entered the popular vocabulary and everybody who has not read any Weber still uses the term. Uh, uh, it's also very important to come to terms with the idea of charisma because uh, uh, Weber was uh, suspected uh, in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s uh, to be actually a proto-fascist. And with the idea of charisma advocating uh, for a strong leadership for Germany, uh, calling for a charismatic leader for Germany, and in a way almost demanding Adolf Hitler. Well, of course, he died in 1920. He could not do that. Uh, uh, but uh, especially um, the philosopher George Lukács accused him to be an irrationalist uh, and uh, uh, being a proto-fascist, laying the ideology for uh, Nazism and Adolf Hitler. Uh, <clears throat> I have to tell you that I am not absolutely certain what Weber would have done in 1930 or 33. I hope, uh, like his brother, would, he would not have gone for the fascists uh, or Nazis, uh, um, but it's complicated. I will try to make a case that in fact the concept of charisma is not quite what Adolf Hitler was. Um, so um, uh, the main major themes of the presentation today First of all, we will deal with the definition of charisma, um, what is charismatic authority. Uh, then we will talk about the sources of charisma, where charisma is coming from. And this is particularly important uh, to see why Weber is actually not a proto-Nazi. Um, uh, then we will be talking about uh, 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 the followers of the charismatic leader. Um, then we will talk about charisma as a revolutionary force, charisma as uh, the uh, vehicle of change. Um, and I think this is an interesting idea in Weber, though one of the weaker points, I think, of Weber theory. Um, I think uh, Karl Marx uh, has a much more coherent and much more persuasive theory about historical change as class struggle, you know, and uh, the contradictions between forces and relations of production. Um, this is uh, 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 historically invalidated, but a very coherent and very persuasive kind of argument. Weber's idea of charisma as a revolutionary force actually has empirical um, relevance, but uh, it's uh, rather unpersuasive, and I will talk about this. Um, and then we come to a big problem with charisma, how charismatic leadership can be routinized or transmitted from a charismatic leader to the next, uh, and what are the methods of succession for a charismatic uh, leader. Uh, so, I mean, those of you who were in my discussion sections, you can see it will not be just a regurgitator of the uh, uh, um, um, discussion sections. And I don't know what happened in other discussion sections. Also, the charisma may have come up. This uh, makes people move, uh, 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 minds, minds move a great deal. So I just uh, step back a minute and again revisit the idea of different types of domination and authority. And uh, this is the simplest scheme I can come up with, but I think this is a good one. 
and I copyright it. I did it. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the question is, where is obedience due to? It can be due to rules, impersonal rules, or it can be due to a personal master, to an individual. That's the big story, right? And if it is due to rules, that's when we are talking about legal rational authority, and this will be the topic uh, and bureaucratic rule, uh, modern liberal democratic system, or modern not that democratic system, but systems which do still do have uh, 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 rules uh, uh, of, uh, 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 of law. Uh, there are actually uh, authoritarian systems which do operate uh, uh, with uh, um, uh, uh, rules of law, where authoritarian leaders actually do themselves follow the law and take law seriously and implement laws uh, uh, seriously. Uh, that, so uh, legal rational authority does not mean liberal democracy. It simply means that this is a system um, in which there is a, a, a rule of law um, even if the leader itself uh, can be not particularly democratic. Democracy, democracy as we understand it, right, is a very recent phenomenon. Uh, universal suffrage uh, in the Western world became uh, widespread since the 1920s, and it really became the dominant form right, of, them, uh, of um, uh, uh, political rule. Uh, much, much later, I would say more like after the Second World War. Um, I mean, Switzerland, for instance, gave rights uh, uh, for women to vote just very recently. Uh, so, well, you know, uh, democracy is, uh, uh, liberal democracy is a very new invention. Li uh, and uh, legal rational authority is not such a new invention. Uh, there was a rule of law um, in England, uh, uh, going back to uh, uh, the Orange Revolution, right? It's going back to the late seventeenth century. Um, there was the rule of law uh, in the United States uh, uh, before the late eighteen uh, and early nineteenth uh, uh, century. Though there was no liberal democracy as we understand that, right? <coughs> there was no universal suffrage at all. Uh, so, I mean, you could have a, a, a rule of law without democracy. But that's still very different from a system where you obey a master. And there are two ways how you obey a master. Uh, you obey because the tradition appointed that master, and that's what we were talking about uh, Tuesday or because the master is believed uh, to have some charismatic features. Uh, I also mentioned it last time that the differences between the three types of authority, legal, rational authority, traditional authority, and charismatic authority, do not have the same, I use the term, ontological status, right? Um, the two big forms in history are traditional authority, which through rationalization eventually becomes legal rational authority. And charismatic authority usually is a transitory stage. Uh, charismatic authority is uh, charismatic leaders emerges uh, in times of great, times of great need, desperation, and need for change. And charismatic leaders, if they deliver, you know, as long as they deliver, they remain leaders. If they stop delivering, charisma is, charisma is taken away from them. And it is extremely difficult for charismatic leader to establish an ongoing system of charismatic authority, right? Because uh, um, uh, it will be very difficult to transfer their own personal charisma to somebody else, right, and to keep running a charismatic system. Okay, so that's about generally, you know, what is charisma? As I said, this really, we, we keep using the term all the time. The last 18 months we used it a lot uh, because of uh, candidate and later President Obama. And uh, there is probably nobody in this room 
who at one point did not say uh, something about Obama's charisma, or, you know, if you did not like him, the lack of his charisma, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, this was a commonly used term. Now this is coming from Weber because he digged this term out from a, a rather obscure theological language, where charisma actually referred to some superhuman qualities of individuals, I would say almost semi-gods, who have some very personal and exclusive relationship to God, and therefore, like any other human beings, they kind of can talk to God, and then they can interpret God's will to the people. These were charismatic leaders. So in the most classical definition of charisma refers right, to the great founders of great world religions. That's what charisma um, in initial meaning meant. Uh, so Muhammad, uh, Moses, uh, or Jesus, uh, they had charisma because they had a special access to God, right? Uh, Moses got the two tables from God, right? He could not see the face of God, but nevertheless got the two tables from God. Nobody else could walk up right there on the mountain and get these tables, you know, and tell people, this is the law, right? It was only Moses who could that, right? And Jesus had a very specific relationship to God, right? Christian belief was even the Son of God, embodiment of God. And undoubtedly, you know, it is believed by Christians that Jesus could actually um, uh, convey to us what God wants us to do, right? Had this very special, unique, charismatic uh, appeal. And Muhammad uh, had this special appeal uh, to, to God. Or if you are Mormon, then Mr. Smith had this very unique, right, relationship to God, right? At one point, an angel came, you know, got a new sacred book, a continuation of the Bible, left it with Mr. Smith, he translated it, and when the translation was gone, you know, the angel came and took it away. This was a charisma, right, a very specific superhuman. It did not happen to any other human being only to Smith, right? That's, uh, um, uh, that is the initial notion of the meaning. But now Weber makes it a, a little, a, a kind of a broader conception. And he said, right, that charisma will be applied to a certain quality of an individual personality. It's important, still an individual who is considered extraordinary. Um, uh, and treated as endowed with supernatural, superhuman. This sounds like the original uh, uh, definition, but then he goes on and he said, or at least exceptional powers and qualities, right? And these are regarded as of divine origin, that's the founders of the great religion, or exemplary. He modifies that, right? It can be just exemplary. You don't have to believe that this is semi-God or the embodiment of God. You only have to believe that this is an exemplary being uh, uh, who has some exceptional abilities, exceptional qualities, um, and that will qualify uh, that you will call somebody uh, a charismatic person. Uh, person or a charismatic leader. Uh, let me also underline one more term from this uh, um, uh, quotation, which is extremely important. Um, but uh, uh, He said, the person is considered to be extraordinary and treated as endowed with superhuman or exemplary features. So in I think what is extremely important to see, that Weber does not tell us that this individual is actually extraordinary, that it is actually superhuman. In a way, it is in the eye of the beholder. It is among the followers who attribute right, to these qualities 
uh, to somebody. So in a way, uh, charismatic leaders are being made by the followers. Uh, um, well, and what is, uh, what is the source of charisma? This is now making it even more clearer and more precise. It rests in recognition. You have to recognize it, charisma. So the relationship of charisma is in the interpersonal relationship between the leaders and the followers. And in this interaction is charisma being created, right? It is not given by the grace of Lord, right, to an individual person. It is created by um, those who are subjected to authority, right? The, and it's also important that the charis uh, those who follow the charismatic leaders are usually seen as followers or disciples, right? They have some extraordinary commitment to this leader, right? Um, uh, this leader creates excitement in them. And this excitement, what creates uh, uh, the community of the followers or the community of the disciples, right? Um, and well, uh, this is, was one of the reasons uh, why uh, uh, many people in the last 18 months uh, regarded uh, uh, Barack Obama as a charismatic leader because he was capable to appearing in a crowd and move the crowd, right? Create excitement in the crowd, right? Uh, he created followers, right? You know, almost, one would say, disciples uh, um, as such. Uh, now, what the charisma can be withdrawn. This is again a very important idea in Weber. He said, if the proof of success elude the leader for too long, it is likely that the charismatic authority will disappear. Right? Uh, so the charismatic leader gives you right, promises that it will produce miracles. And when the charismatic leader does not produce these miracles, um, right, he must work miracles, I said um, uh, Weber. Then the people withdraw the recognition of charisma from the leader, and the master simply becomes a private person, an ordinary person. It loses its uh, individual appeal. Well, uh, uh, what is uh, uh, very important, right? Uh, that uh, uh, the charismatic leader has to promise you miracles, right? Has to promise you that it will deliver something what you desperately need, right? Charisma is deeply rooted uh, in the conditions in the situation in which charismatic leader is being constructed by the followers. When you are in a desperate need, then you are looking for a charismatic leader which can solve this problem what you think is almost unresolvable. Then the charismatic leader will come and will promise you that this problem, uh, uh, that charismatic leader will be able to solve because it's extraordinary characteristics. Um, and again, if I can come back to the last uh, elections, that was, you know, clearly uh, the case, uh, um, uh, 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 the way how uh, candidate uh, um, Obama was capable to win the elections. You remember one of the key words, right, which uh, characterized the campaign. Um, uh, hope, change, yes we can. I mean, these are very typical elements, right, of a charismatic appeal, right? You are in need, you want hope, you want to have business as not usual, you want to have a new type of business. Now, this is what I promise you, right? Change and hope, and I empower you. I'm the person who can empower you, right? It can be done, 
right? We can do it, right? Yes, it can be done. Hope, change, yes, can be done. These are very typical elements, right, what a charismatic leader does produce. Um, in recent history, other charismatic leaders, which are probably not as attractive uh, in historical perspective as Obama, they became charismatic leaders the same way. Fidel Castro established charisma for himself. The Cuban society was in desperate need for change in 1960, and Fidel Castro appealed, and he said, well, I will bring pain to, uh, change to you. I will get rid of this corrupt government. I will create equality, right? I will help the poor. The poor will get wealthier. I will create affluence, right? I will create a just and affluent society, right? And therefore, he came up with promises what people were looking for, and then charisma was attributed to Fidel Castro. Uh, Adolf Hitler emerged as a charismatic leader, right? Uh, Germany suffered a humiliating defeat in the First World War. Then it was hit with a Great Depression, which hit Germany even worse than it hit the United States. And then Adolf Hitler appealed, um, and though he was not quite as an attractive personality as Obama, he was, you know, quite a ridiculous guy, but he actually said, well, I can solve the problems for you, right? Uh, we find an enemy, it's all Jewish conspiracy, we get rid of the Jews, and I will turn things around, and, you know, we, we, have, uh, we, we will have a new empire. And that it was a capable with this promise. There was a need in the situation where people were looking for leadership, and they were looking for a strong leader, a charismatic leader, and they attributed this charismatic leadership people to them. The problem comes when they cannot deliver. Uh, certainly Hitler, when the Russian troops were already fighting around Berlin, was no charismatic leader any longer, right? He was hiding in the bunker, considering suicide, and his charisma was gone altogether, because he did not deliver, he did not do the miracles, right? And therefore his charisma was withdrawn. Um, now about the followers, right? Uh, he said the followers of a charismatic leader um, are also often, often bound together by emotional ties and they are create an emotional community with each other. Uh, Weber uses this German for term, Vergemeinschaftung. They become kind of a community. If there is a real religious leader with a charismatic appeal, it creates always communities of people. I don't know if any one of you ever had experiences of some fundamentalist religious experience. I did when I was a teenager. There was, you know, a preacher. A, a, interestingly, he also did not look charismatic. He was even not a great speaker. I don't know how on earth he had this curious charismatic appeal, but he did. He did have an impact on me. I attributed charisma to him. And he's kind of created a community around himself, right? We all were brothers and sisters together who kind of believe uh, in the charismatic uh, preacher. This is very often in kind of sectarian, fundamentalist uh, religious groups, be it Christian or be it Muslim, be it evangelical. There must be people in this room, right, who in the, at least when they were teenagers experienced that, right? And you are a teenager and you want to get out of your family and you are looking for a new community. I mean, this kind of religious communities very often offer an alternative. And some of you may still be in such a, a community. And if you are, I envy you. I think it is, uh, you know, as I recall, it was a wonderful experience in some ways. Vergemeinschaftung. You had your family, right? You have your spiritual family where you belong to. 
Does it make any sense what I'm saying? But I think there must be people, right, who experience that or are still experiencing it, right? Uh, so that's what he calls Vergemeinschaftung. Gemeinschaft means community. When the mass society relationships becomes a relationships like a community. And indeed, in ca even in charismatic political campaign, you have this sense that we belong together, the com common cause, right? There was Vergemeinschaftung in civil rights movement, right? That there were these charismatic leaders, Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy, right? And uh, the whole idea of civil right and that we go together, right? And we go to the South and we demonstrate, right? And we demand civil rights from these bloody races, right? That created a sense of community among people, right? Who had this belief uh, uh, on change. Um, uh, uh, and if, if you are actually in such a community, you have a kind of personal devotion uh, to the leader. Uh, and there is a certain degree of enthusiasm of what emerges in you, right? Uh, 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 which is of occasionally coming out uh, of despair. Uh, that you are desperate and then you hope to have some salvation, uh, some solution to an irresolvable problem by the charismatic leader. That's how in communism charismatic leaders like Lenin or Mao or Castro emerged. Right? These were all societies in deep trouble after humiliations, after wars in big need for some, some major structural change, and then they were looking for a savior, right, who will solve these unresolvable problems and will lead out uh, to paradise. Now, it's also interesting that, you know, uh, in charismatic communities there is usually relatively little hierarchy, not all that much of a bureaucracy. Um, uh, um, uh, those who are actually serving the charismatic leader usually do not uh, get uh, uh, salaries or benefits. It's again true, you know, even for uh, charismatic political leaders that they get a, a whole army of volunteers because they are so strongly believe, right, in the cause that they volunteer that time and money. Well, here comes uh, an interesting and uh, 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 disturbing proposition that he said, well, but because charisma is such an extraordinary form, it's as a, as a system of charismatic authority, it is opposed to a rational and bureaucratic authority, right? Uh, therefore, it is kind of irrational in the sense of being foreign to all established rules. Because what is the charismatic leader about? To change. And the change means that there will be new rules of the game. And you don't know exactly what these rules of the games are. And this is what makes if the charismatic authority is a whole system as operating, a high level of uncertainty to the system. Uh, and now forget about American politics because in the United States um, we clearly have a legal rational system, right? That's what characterizes the United States of America. And occasionally we see emerging uh, uh, politicians who actually do implement some level of change or promise change, whether they can deliver or not, will greatly affect how long we attach charisma to these people. But from Roosevelt to JFK to Martin Luther King uh, to uh, 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 Obama, there were politicians which this charismatic appeal, but the system itself was not charismatic, right? And uh, charisma helped leaders to get elected, and charisma actually may help a leader 
uh, to be able to make some strong and important changes early in, in life. Those who are critical of President Obama usually are critical of him that he has not moving fast and forcefully enough, was not cashing in in his charisma early, right, in his presidency. Um, and there is, you know, some signs that in fact, you know, his charisma, charismatic appeal uh, is weakening, right? There are some people who say, well, I feel betrayed, you know, I was promised change, and I see a lot of politics as usual, right? Uh, so this is, uh, of course, an inevitable problem. If a leader who uh, has this charismatic appeal finds itself in the legal rational authority, right, then actually it's very difficult to implement a change. You want to change the rules, the laws, you have to go through Congress to do that, right? You just cannot declare that from now onwards uh, there is a new game, uh, rules of the game. And that is, sounds very much like politics as usual. That's very different uh, from what Lenin or Mao Zedong did, right? Lenin and Mao Zedong were not guided by rules. They established the rules. I mean, Mao Zedong is a particularly interesting character, right? He established first a bureaucratic rule in China, and then he launches the Cultural Revolution, right? He launches an anti-bureaucratic movement, and the top leader of the bureaucracy is becoming the major popular leader of an anti-bureaucratic movement. I mean, this guy was really quite something, quite extraordinary. And in a way, he did that you know, because his charisma was weakening by the 1960s. First, he promised great leap forward. You know, in no time we will catch up and we will look like the United States. And what happened with the great leap forward? Disaster! People were starving to death. So he was not delivering the miracle. So what does he do next? He shows as he is. Uh, uh, will change the rules of the game. He launches the Cultural Revolution, and he, he suddenly becomes the leader of people who actually should be opposing him. Uh, you know, he's generating this kind of miracles. You know, the last miracle that he's trying to generate at all age, that he goes swimming in the Yangtze River. You see, you think I'm old and I'm dying? No, I'm superhuman, I still can swim, right? This is the kind of, you know, trying to rescue, right? Your charismatic appeal, that it is about to be taken away from you. Um, but on the whole, as we see, as they establish these charismatic leaders, establish this charismatic system, they can change the rules. And, you know, if you look at Chinese history, every five years everything is completely different, right? Um, uh, first, a hundred flowers flourish, we will let everybody go. Then, you know, great leap forward, then, you know, cultural revolution. He is changing the rules all the time. This is an unpredictable environment. Can the economy work in this unpredictable environment? No, it cannot. The same goes for the Nazis. And the same goes for the Stalinists, right? It was unpredictable environment. It was not good for business. Business needs a predictable environment, right? It needs the rule um, of law. That's why capitalist business, at least, uh, likes legal rational authority. They don't necessarily like democratic system, right? Capitalism can live nicely with authoritarian figures. A capitalist love the Pinochet, right? Uh, uh, but, you know, Pinochet was, you know, reasonable legal rational authority. I mean, at the beginning, you know, he was killing people like crazy. But then he established a reasonably predictable system, and capitalists loved it. And for a while, you know, the Chilean economy, partially advised by Milton Friedman, you know, boosted. So, I mean, what capitalism really wants is a predictable environment. And in many ways, you know, 
Um, democracy is not all that good for a predictable environment because every fourth year we go to the pools and then we elect other people and then they come up with other ideas and this is a bit of a mess. So in, in, in reality, I would almost say that a good uh, free market economy loves rule of law uh, with a kind of authoritarian liberal and a long-standing political stability. They don't like these big changes, right? in the political system. Uh, well, um, no, and charisma as a revolutionary force. This is very important. I think Weber, first of all, makes a very specific argument. He said it is always in traditionalistic periods, right? Traditional authority, when charisma is the great revolutionary force. So in fact, in a modern legal rational authority, it is not so much charisma which carries the change through. It is technical innovation, and it is the kind of routine and boring elections every four years which brings changes by gradually and incrementally. The big change is occurring from one type of traditional authority to another type of authority, and in order to change the value system of one type of tradition to another type of tradition, that's when you need charismatic leaders. So he said, right, bureaucratic rationalization is the major revolutionary force. But you know, in a bureaucratic system like what we have, it is a, really a revolution from the south. It is coming from technological change. We have revolution, oh yes. I mean, the first time when I heard that is stuff like internet is, was uh, 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 email, it was 1976. And now I'm an inter, you know, uh, uh, email uh, ad addict, as many of you know. You send me an email, and occasionally in five minutes you get an answer from me, because I always checking my email like crazy. This was all new, this was coming from the outside. Now, uh, charisma, on the other hand, this is very insightful, very important. It is revolution from within. What charisma is doing is changing the value systems in you, right? That's what charismatic leaders do achieve, to persuade you that you have to have a different kind of value system. And that's why I think charismatic leadership does play a role, not only in traditional societies, but you know, charismatic leaders in a legal rational authority do play a role to change people's value systems uh, in substantial ways. Um, again, we discuss that in discussion sections, those who are not in my discussion section, just uh, let me invoke the civil rights movement, right? The civil rights movement in 10 years in the United States produced a change in value systems our attitudes to race relationships and gender relationships, which otherwise would have taken a hundred years, right? It happened in 10 short years that we completely rethought uh, race and gender relationships in this country, right? Uh, and this, to a large extent, demanded, right, charismatic leaders. It demanded, right, uh, Martin Luther King, right? Uh, who had a dream, right, about a society where there can be a different type of value system. And in no time, I mean, you were too young to experience that, but your parents and grandparents experienced that. And talk to them, they will tell you, right, how fundamentally their world outlook and looking at a person of another race or how they begin to treat uh, 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 women in their family or girls in their family, how radically it changed almost instantly, right? Because it was a change from within, right? Uh, that's what charismatic revolution is all about. Um, and well, this is, uh, 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 of course, uh, uh, has everything to do against routine. Charismatic is not doing things as they used to be. That's why it is the opposite, right, of one type of traditionalism. And the problem is what happens if the charismatic leader disappears and dies. And that's when we have the problem, how can the charismatic leader 
be replaced. That's a very big issue. And there are different methods of succession. And let me just walk you through of this. It's uh, not quite uninteresting. It can be search. It can be by revelation. It can be designation by the original leader. It can be designation by a staff, which is particularly qualified to decide who is the next charismatic leader will be. Right? The, the issue is how can you maintain a charismatic si system going on. It can be hereditary, that some hereditary line is established, and it can be office charisma. The office itself can carry charisma. Now let me just briefly talk to each one of these. Church. Well, um, the best example is how you find the Dalai Lama, right? It happens to the church. The Dalai Lama dies. You know that the Dalai Lama is reincarnated. So you send out people and looking for a child who is the reincarnation of the Dalai Lama. There must be just one child who is the reincarnation of the Dalai Lama. And then you have experts who can tell, go around, and then they find this child. This is the new Dalai Lama, and then it will be brought up and will become the Dalai Lama. And of course, we'll have a great deal uh, of charisma. And uh, you can see it works. Uh, the Dalai Lama does have a lot of charisma, right? <laughs> well, whether you believe in reincarnation or not, that's another story. <laughs> Uh, uh, probably most people in this room do not believe in it, but if you do not believe in it, even more miraculous, why the Dalai Lama has this quite extraordinary charisma. There are people who just get wild if they can get near to the Dalai Lama. I had a student in uh, Taiwan who actually turned into a Buddhist and became a great follower of the Dalai Lama. He got a PhD uh, from uh, UCLA, um, but he's following wherever the Dalai Lama goes, he's always there, because he has this charisma. This charisma is attributed to him, right? He was found in the right way, and he was established as a charismatic leader. It can happen through revelation. Revelation actually means uh, that uh, there are uh, some people who believed to have some kind of access to some divine authority who can declare that this is a person uh, who is uh, the next charismatic leader. Well, I don't think in contemporary world revelation is all that much. Though, I mean, newspapers do it for you, right? The newspapers do create charismatic leaders for you. They attach charisma, they build up the charismatic powers um, of, a, of a person. The media does it for you. And certainly the charisma attributed to um, rock stars, right? Rock stars do have charisma, right? Um, is created through the media. The media has the oracle, right? He knows who the great guys are and whom you have to get absolutely excited when you get to the concert. Well, there can be a designation by the original leader. Um, if the charismatic leader is dying, then the charismatic leader has a problem to find a successor. That's very difficult to do because charismatic leaders are bloody scared that if they designate a leader, then they will be poisoned or murdered. <laughs> uh, the new leader wants to take it over too often. Very often we see charismatic leaders designating leaders and then murdering them. That's a long history in humankind. But, you know, an interesting example was that Stalin tried to build up his charisma by faking uh, a testimonial of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, in which assumedly Lenin said that Stalin will be the successor. This was all lie. Lenin actually disliked uh, uh, 
uh, Stalin a great deal and was very reluctant to name a successor. But he forged this letter and tried to say, well, I inherited the charisma. And he had a lot of problems actually to establish his charisma. Eventually, in fact, during the Second World War, he managed to emerge as a charismatic leader, and not in, only in the Soviet Union, but even in the West. There's a lot of people in the United States, as uh, the, the Soviet army defeated the Germans first um, in uh, Moscow, and then of course in Stalingrad, that they began to see Stalin as a great leader, right, as a charismatic great leader. He probably had nothing to do with the success of the Red Army. Well, or it can be designated by a qualified staff. Uh, this is the way how, for instance, uh, the Pope is being uh, 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 selected. And the Pope does have right, a charismatic authority. Uh, if you are Roman Catholic, you know that the Pope has some access to God what you, ordinary Roman Catholics, do not have. And how is, but it's going on from one pope to the next. The character of the pope will matter, right? There are some more, you know, charming, more persuasive popes, whom you see more of uh, charismatic leaders. There are other popes who are more like bureaucrats. But nevertheless, even the bureaucratic kind of popes are assumed to be charismatic, and they are selected. Uh, by a designated staff, there is a certain set of archbishops. When a, one pope dies, they gather together in Rome, and they cannot leave, you know, the room until they agree, they achieve a consensus. Who is the other person who will have this special relationship to God, right? Uh, there is also hereditary charisma that you try to pass uh, uh, charisma on to your children, very hard to do. Uh, North Korea is trying to do that, right? Kim Il-sung passed uh, uh, his uh, charisma on to Kim Jong-il, which is an absolutely ridiculous guy. But nevertheless, you know, somehow uh, it looks like, you know, that in Korea he does have some kind of charismatic appeal. So, I mean, this is not totally impossible. I mean, that's a bad idea, you know, if you are a charismatic leader to pass charisma on this tree. Finally, office charisma. This is very important. Incumbents of an office is supposed to have some charismatic, depending on the office, but the office of the Pope, of course, is supposed to have charisma, but we actually uh, do use this very often. We do, well, in the United States, we, we call this leadership. Uh, that we expect people in, po in position of certain authorities to offer leadership, to have vision, right? And this is an, a kind of a charisma which goes uh, with, with the office. And, you know, I have been department chair uh, quite a few times, and uh, it's so interesting moving into the position of department chair and moving out of it. But your relationship to your colleagues change a great deal, you know. When you are the department chair, you, there is suddenly some charisma is attributed to you, right? Uh, you are supposed to offer some kind of leadership, and you are believed to be able to bring in some change. I just remember, you know, one of the institutions when I was an incoming outside chair, how people said, "Oh, you came in like fresh air." Well, in two years' time, it was all gone. I was not fresh air. I was routine, you know, I was operating in a bureaucracy, massaging the bureaucracy to get things done. My charisma was all gone. But there is, right, um, I think it's a very American thing, right, that you attach an expectations to an incumbent of the office that it can actually carry out change, bring in fresh air, right? to have a vision and to do things better than it was done before. Okay, that's about charisma. Thank you.